following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, Christianity criminalized. I wouldn't have believed it. Why is this MP under fire? Are they really going this far? For tweeting a passage from the Bible. There will come time when each one of us will be in front of the firing squad. Then, why did this dad head to jail? And they arrested him as well. For his son's crime. And I remember feeling in my heart, like, you are horrible. The answers on today's 700 Club. Madness in Richmond, the capital of what used to be called the Old Dominion. They have gone insane. Can you imagine making the government a weapon against the church? Virginia is the largest state pursuing an alarming progressive agenda that could do just that, destroying religious liberty. Well, what's really behind the push to control churches and Christian schools? CBN's Eric Phillips brings us the answer from Richmond, Virginia. Three controversial bills are close to final votes. Opponents point out that their major concern is the same steps being taken to stop discrimination, trample on the religious freedom of the faithful. As everyone is aware, the bills came fast and furious this session with nearly 50 bills to further the LGBTQ agenda. The Family Foundation came to Richmond sounding the alarm over bills they believe represent a weaponizing of the government against the church. Two, outlaw discrimination in public places based on factors such as gender and sexual orientation. If they become law, it could have serious implications for an all-boys Christian school and similar organizations. The laws being proposed really at the end of the day are going to hurt freedom of speech and uh, freedom of religion to express one's religion and religious convictions. Separate boys and girls restrooms could also become a thing of the past if the Democratic majority has its way. A third bill would prohibit hiring and firing practices based on gender or sexual orientation. Think about churches that only have male priests or a convent with all female nuns. How far would it go? This is the first time we've ever seen something that affects quote unquote public accommodation, which is very vaguely defined and will sweep in anything that's essentially open to the public. And because people of faith have different views about what is sexuality and what are genders, um, they're going to come under the wrath of government for having a counter view. Opponents of the bills say the very rules meant to thwart discrimination would in fact heap it on them. We're very concerned that this could lead to persecution of our churches in various forms and penalties from the state simply because of our religious beliefs and convictions. On CBN News' Faith Nation, Regent University's Gerson moreno Riano said he's very concerned about the potential expansion of the attorney general's prosecutorial powers. To argue that the attorney general, the chief law enforcement officer of the state of Virginia, could initiate civil actions based on what he or she may think is happening or what could happen, again, very, very scary. The Family Foundation will push for amendments to these bills to protect faith-based entities. But if they pass as is, they will then turn to the governor to make the changes, though the chances of that are slim. In Richmond, Virginia, Eric Phillips, CBN News. Well, progressives across the country are urging other states to follow what they call the Virginia model. Let's let these lawmakers know that you stand for religious liberty and against this attempt to weaponize the government. We ask you to go to cbn.com slash faith in action and let your voice be heard. Just to log on, cbn.com cbn mm -hmm. faith uh, in action. Stand against uh, attacks on life and religious liberty being advocated in Virginia I just cannot believe how fast this is taking place. But it shows what these so-called progressives will do when a few of them get in power. They just go crazy. They have a, an agenda. And imagine that one young boy was denied access to the schools in, in one county in Northern Virginia because he refused to identify a person as a man or a woman or a he or a she. And finally, he started using the person's name and they let him get away with it. But up to that point, 
if somebody is transgression uh, gender and you know it was a man who's turned into a woman, you've got to you, how do you identify him and what bathrooms do you use? I mean, it just gets crazy, especially when you have men competing in women's sporting events. That is out, outrageous, but it's happening all across the country. Well, in other news, it's showtime in Las Vegas. Tonight, Michael Bloomberg comes face to face with his Democratic opponents. The question is, will it be a bloodbath? John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau. Thanks, Pat. Democratic candidate for President Michael Bloomberg faces his rivals for the first time tonight. The field taking the debate stage in Nevada three days before the state's caucus. And as Charlene Aaron explains, it's expected to get nasty. Tonight's debate could see Democrats tearing into former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, the billionaire businessman facing other Democrats on the debate stage for the first time, and it could get nasty. He's vaulted to double-digit showings in the polls after a $380 million ad blitz, bypassing his opponents and skipping the early primary states. A new Washington Post ABC News poll shows Bernie Sanders surging in first place at 32 percent. Bloomberg is now battling with former Vice President Joe Biden for second place after his ad blitz. Democratic rivals Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg, who've been toiling on the campaign trail for months, attacking him as buying the election. The working people of this country are tired of a corrupt political system in which billionaires think they can buy elections. No, oh, he's definitely trying to buy the race, but here's the thing, it's not that simple. Uh, you have to actually be willing to look voters in the eye to uh, take questions. At some point, you've got to be ready to be challenged. I can't beat him on the airwaves, but I can beat him on the debate stage. Bloomberg has announced that if he wins the presidential election, he'll put his company into a blind trust and sell it. The former New York City mayor is also vulnerable to accusations of past comments demeaning women and his former support of stop and frisk policies in minority neighborhoods. Michael Bloomberg with $62 billion can buy every ad he wants, but he can't, in fact, wipe away his record on everything from dealing with stop and frisk to his foreign policy. On CBN's Faith Nation program, CBN News political correspondent David Brody discussed Bloomberg's first debate appearance. Well, all of the fire will be on Bloomberg for sure. He is going to be a man with an X on his uh, back and front and head and all of that. Uh, look, wh why is he rising? He, he is rising for sure. I mean, I can't go. I mean, I watch television. There it is. Bloomberg, Bloomberg. I mean, it's TV ad after TV ad. Meanwhile, President Trump is staying in Las Vegas as he visits several states in the region, including California. He'll hold a campaign rally in Nevada Friday night, the day before the state's caucus. Well, I'll be making a speech in Nevada. We got more votes than any incumbent president in history in Iowa and in New Hampshire, as you saw. Um, and in that case, I went just before the day before, and I went the day before in both cases, Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, so uh, it seems to be effective. The Nevada caucus also poses a new challenge for several Democratic candidates. It's the first time they'll be facing a test of minority voters. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Pat, a lot of drama in the Democratic presidential primary field. Well, they're, they're hoping that uh, they won't focus on Bloomberg's wealth because that apparently is a loser. They need to focus on what he's had to say and some of the things are just outrageous. What he said about farmers. Well, I can teach anybody to farm. You just dig a hole in the ground, drop a few uh, seeds in it and, and uh, put some water in it and up comes the, the, the uh, plant. I can teach anybody to farm. Oh man, he's insulted farmers, he's insulted women. And uh, if they'll focus on those things, they, they might have a winner. But Bloomberg is certainly pouring out the money. He's loaded with it. and. Uh, he thinks, uh, well, we'll see what happens. John? Pat, the Department of Justice is, dis is disputing media reports that Attorney General Bill Barr is considering resigning after President Trump wouldn't listen to his warning to stop tweeting about Justice Department cases. A DOJ spokeswoman tweeting, addressing the Beltway rumors, the Attorney General has no plans to resign. The reports Barr might resign comes days after Barr took a public swipe at the president, saying the president's tweets made it impossible for him to do his job. Trump insisted he has a legal right to intervene in criminal cases, but also says he knows he makes things difficult for Barr. 
I do make his job harder. I do agree with that. I think that's true. He's a very straight shooter. We have a great attorney general. I'm allowed to be totally involved. I'm actually, I guess, the chief law enforcement officer of the country. Barr also denied that the president ever asked him to do anything in a criminal case. The president stirring more controversy Tuesday, announcing pardons and commutations for 11 people, most notably former Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich, who was serving a 14-year sentence for trying to auction off the former Senate seat of Barack Obama. Pat? Well, I think um, the president loves to tweet. He thinks that's his way of reaching the nation. But in his and honestly, if there's a criminal case going on and the Justice Department is trying to bring an action against a, a person perhaps who's now the defendant and they have to bring a case before a judge, so the president starts tweeting things that the judge is crooked and he can't stand any of his past conduct, or if he starts beating up on members of the Justice Department, that will just completely make um, Attorney General Barr's task almost impossible. And that's what he said. And so it seems like to me the president should exercise some restraint. It's not that he doesn't have the power. Of course he's got the power. But uh, you can use your power in the wrong way. So he just restraint. That's all is being asked for. But it's amazing. Uh, he's, he's pardoning all kinds of people. Michael Milken, Blagojevich. Blagojevich, <laughs> Blago, Blago in Illinois. There you go. <laughs> I think Blago got a bad rap, and I think that he deserves a pardon. And then uh, others that he's pardoned, well, it's no problem about that. Because some, you know, Michael F Flynn, for example, the case was rigged, and he, he deserves uh, a pardon, and he, they, they need to, to, they need to get, you know, the idea that. We have law enforcement that rigs cases, puts people in jail for falsely, or uh, withholds exculpatory evidence. That sort of thing isn't good. And the president has an absolute right to exercise the pardon. That he's got that privilege. And if he's doing it, I think people applaud it. John? Pat, new cases of the coronavirus appear to be slowing. China announcing more than 1,700 new cases and 136 new deaths, bringing the total number to over 74,000 infections and just over 2,000 deceased. Among the latest deaths, a 51-year-old doctor in Wuhan, China, leading the fight against the virus there. In Japan, the quarantine on a cruise ship is ending. More than 600 cases of the virus were diagnosed on the ship, the largest number of infections in one place outside of China those who have not been diagnosed with the virus will be allowed to leave but face quarantines in their home countries. While the locust swarm ravaging Africa is now moving into South Sudan, that nation already suffering widespread hunger. More than 5.5 million people, nearly half of the population there, already lack adequate food due to civil war, droughts and flooding. In Kenya, the government is mobilizing young people to fight the plague, training hundreds of cadets in how to identify and eradicate the locusts with pesticides. The United Nations and local authorities are also asking for more aircraft to spray the bugs. The swarm could increase up to 500 times by June, putting tens of millions of people at risk for food shortages. For more on the story, let's go back to Pat. Well, CBN senior international correspondent George Thomas is just back from the region. George, you've made several trips to southern Sudan, which I understand is a Christian country. What about the suffering there? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely uh, right, Pat. Uh, Three-fifths of South Sudan uh, is Christian. As you know, Pat, it's the newest country to gain independence, gaining independence from Sudan back in 2011. But sadly, in those years since independence, it has been racked by civil war. As John mentioned, 60 percent of South Sudan is facing acute food uh, insecurity. There's been widespread drought. Uh, and then on top of this, you have these locusts. We have a map from, from the United Nations showing the, 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 the locusts continuing to spread. You can see there right at the bottom edge of South Sudan. It's creeping across the border. It has made its way into Uganda and Tanzania. But again, it, it's, coming, you know, it's coming to these countries that are already uh, very uh, instable and fa facing all kinds of challenges, both politically and economically. And for South Sudan, Pat, it's almost just devastating. On top of all of this, the, the latest figures from the United Nations say that about 2 million children were about to face severe malnutrition 
even without the problem of these locusts. Well, George, you've been in touch with our offices in Kenya. What are they saying about the impact of locusts in that uh, country? Yeah, I just got a report this morning from our office in Nairobi, the capital city. They say that uh, 17 provinces just east of Nairobi have been severely uh, impacted. Uh, the, the worst one is Kitui uh, uh, County. There, a farmer just this week, uh, Theophilus um, uh, Kamanati, uh, said to local reporters that he woke up last week and saw that his entire farm had been devastated by the crops. He said, quote, Quote, the locusts feasted on the maize, green grams. They even ate watermelons. They also ate what was meant for our cows and goats. We are in a dire situation. The Kenyan government announcing just this morning that they were going to import uh, hundreds of gallons of uh, pesticide from the Japanese. They're deploying about five planes uh, to try and deal with this problem. They're also looking into the possibility of using drone technology to try and combat this. But this is a huge problem. We're talking billions of locusts, and uh, they're just uh, a little late uh, to the game, Pat. George, one last question. Have you learned in your studies, has there ever been anything of this magnitude? They talk about biblical proportions, but this seems to be as extensive as anything in, in modern history. You're absolutely right, Pat. Uh, for the people in Kenya, this is the worst they have seen in 70 years. In Somalia, it's been 30 years since they've seen anything like this. The latest reports from Somalia, over 200,000 acres of land completely uh, destroyed. We did stories last week, I mean, I'm sorry, last year about uh, locust infestation into Saudi Arabia. Today, Saudi Arabia is on, uh, on national alert. Jordan is also has declared national emergency, and there is also concerned that the locusts coming through South Sudan will make its way all the way up to Egypt. And so when you talk about biblical proportions, you're absolutely right. Never have you seen anything like this. And obviously, folks are talking about the different changes in the climate and uh, the amount of water and the rain that they've gotten in this part of the region that just makes it all the more challenging for those in these very vulnerable countries, Pat. Thanks, George. You're welcome. You know, people talk about this politics and they're worried about a debate in uh, Las Vegas and so forth. I mean, this is nothing compared to the suffering that is being uh, uh, impending on these nations. You, you, ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't want to overstate it, but this is an unbelievable tragedy in places like Kenya, South Sudan, Sans Tanzania. Places that are already compromised. Already compromised, stand. exactly. They're, they're suffering food shortage to begin with. And before it's finished, millions of people will die because of famine. And the, the United Nations and all of our resources need to be mobilized to, to address this thing because it is going to affect the whole world. Terry? Well, coming up, Finland is slapping hate speech charges on people for quoting the Bible. Why are they being targeted and why is no one standing up for them? And then he did the crime. Will his father do the time? Why was this dad thrown behind bars for something his son did? Find out later on today's show. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm, we've got some stories about uh, hate crimes and things like that. Uh, but uh, I really believe that the gospel is moving around the world as never before. There's a move of the Holy Spirit throughout the world, and millions are coming to faith in Jesus Christ all over the world. It's the biggest revival in the history of mankind. So there is an enemy. And you'd always expect when you win a battle that there'll be a, a counterattack by the enemy. And I think what we're seeing is the counterattack by an enemy who is losing. So let's see what's happening in Finland. Here's a real shocker. A woman is accused of a so-called hate crime because she tweeted a verse out of the Finnish Bible. It's happening more and more in European countries and criminalizing Christianity. And we just mentioned what seems to be happening in Virginia. So why are Bible-believing Christians considered dangerous? Well, the devil thinks they're dangerous, and he's going after them.
But the Lord God is on the throne, and the Bible says he will laugh them to scorn. Why do the nations uh, rage and the heathens imagine a vain thing? He that sits in the heavens will laugh them to scorn. Dale Hurd has this shocking report from Finland. Almost 70% of Finns are members of the National Lutheran Church, but it doesn't mean they're believers. Less than a third of Finns now say they believe in God. This historically Christian nation has not only left the faith, but has begun criminal investigations of Christians. This is a nation with a constitution that still tells the state church to proclaim a Bible-based Christian faith. So why is Finland investigating this member of parliament for proclaiming her Bible-based Christian faith? Paivi Rosinen is under two investigations for allegedly defaming or insulting homosexuals. The first after she shared a Bible verse on social media, aimed at Finland's Lutheran church for promoting the homosexual lifestyle. In my tweet, I directly cited Romans first chapter and verses 24 to 27 and posted a picture. A passage which condemns homosexuality. Finland's attorney general has now opened a second investigation concerning a 24-page pamphlet that Paivi wrote 15 years ago about biblical Christian marriage called Man and Woman, He Created Them. Biblical teaching that the Finnish constitution says it supports. So you thought that because of that, this this investigation wouldn't go anywhere, as we said. Yes, from. yes, yes. I yeah. I I I assumed. In fact, I. It was a surprise for me that there is even a police investigation about that case. I wouldn't have believed it. Leif Namala is editor of a Christian newspaper and a TV host in Finland. It was unbelievable. It was a real surprise, and uh, the first thought was. Are we really, are they really going this far? The Lutheran pastor who published the pamphlet Paivi wrote on Christian marriage is also under investigation. Finnish Christian broadcaster, author and theologian Pazi Turunen says this has been a rude awakening for many Christians. Finnish Christians have lived in a very homogeneous Christian culture. It's been very easy because everybody thinks and believes the same way pretty much. And now this has become completely a new situation for us when our faith is challenged in a public square. Paivi says this all began in prayer when she felt led by the Lord to do something to wake up the National Church in Finland on the issue of homosexuality, but now fears this investigation will silence Christians. I'm afraid and I'm worried that this case, the criminal investigation, might frighten some Christians uh, to hide and to keep silent. It raises the, the threshold of saying anything in, in the public square. And in one way, I see that that's the purpose of this kind of attack, to put a high price tag on speaking your Christian mind out loud in, in the society. If convicted, Paivi could be fined or even imprisoned. And both Turinen and Namala say support for her from Finland's evangelical leaders has been weak. We could easily have 200,000 Christians saying, this is horrendous, stop persecuting Päivi Räsänen. And that would have a huge impact, but they are silent. I, I would wish that, that the evangelical leaders would be more outspoken and, and bold. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, there will come time when each one of us will be in front of the firing squad. Paivi says she's not afraid and believes God has a plan in this for Finland. I'm waiting what God is doing, <laughs> because when he raises up prayers, then we can know that he's doing something. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Helsinki. As a fellow said, I've read the back of the book and we win. You know, the, the, the Lord will always win. And I think this is a counterattack by the enemy against those of us who are seeing the onslaught, I mean, the, the, the movement of, of the Holy Spirit throughout the world is powerful, absolutely powerful. And so rejoice, you know, because the day of the Lord is, is coming 
and uh, he is going to vindicate those who stand with him and those who are his servants. He knows who belongs to him. Terry? Well, next Wednesday, we're going to be doing a special voicemail edition of your questions and some honest answers. So if you have a question for Pat, here's the special number you can call. It would be 1-800-677-7884. I'll give that again in a moment. When you call, leave a voicemail message with your question, and then we'll be answering those questions next Wednesday. That's February the 26th, right here on the 700 Club. Here's that special number again. It's one 800 677 7884 800-677-7884. So give us a call, ask your question, and then we'll, we'll hear you ask it next Wednesday. Well, still ahead, hanging by a thread. This ministry looks after some of the world's most at-risk babies and toddlers. So why are people complaining? But first, a prodigal's father. His son got into a car accident and the cops found drugs. So why did they both wind up in jail? Joe Lombardo heard the steel bars slam shut and then lock. For the first time in his life, Joe had been arrested. And now he was in jail. What was his crime? He tried to protect his own son. And I remember walking past my dad's cell. His head was in his hands, and he was just praying. It was hard for Michael Lombardo to see his dad behind bars, especially since it was Michael's fault he was there. And I remember feeling in my heart, like, you are horrible. The youngest of four, Michael grew up in a close-knit, blue-collar Christian home in New Jersey. For the most part, life was good, until Michael hit his teen years. I got involved with a group of friends, and we were all about drinking, partying, sleeping around. I enjoyed that lifestyle. I was in a punk rock band. We would travel around New Jersey a little bit and play shows. And I was like, I'm just going to dive into that lifestyle. I want nothing to do with this God stuff. Michael often disappeared for days at a time. His parents, Joe and Stephanie, worried. It was very hard. You know, a lot of tears, a lot of sleepless nights. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know if he was okay or not. I just had to trust God. We had to trust God. I would sit him down and, you know, tell him, hey, what are you doing with yourself here? I know you're high. And, but in one ear and out the other. He wasn't our Michael anymore. Still, they loved and supported their son. His dad even gave him a job at his construction business after high school. But despite the warning signs, Michael wasn't about to stop. As I got a little bit older, 17, 18, 19, things, parties got crazier, the lifestyle got more reckless, and drugs were taking a toll on me physically. And I began to realize like, hey, this isn't as, as cool and as great as I, as I thought it was. His parents prayed constantly. Stephanie says Psalm 91 brought her comfort. Guardian God for his people Israel. I'd just be, you know, weeping. And then you just have to kind of wipe those tears away and just start speaking the word of God. Just start claiming his promises, you know, and, and, and agreeing with what God sees in Michael. One night, 18-year-old Michael had a car accident near his parents' home and was arrested for drug possession. His dad drove to the scene and tried to help. And they arrested him as well for obstructing justice. And I remember walking past my dad's cell. His head was in his hands, and he was just praying. And I remember feeling in my heart, like, you are horrible. And a lot of guilt, a lot of shame came in. Just kind of like gave it to God and said, Lord, you know, we don't know what to do with him anymore. He's yours. Joe and Michael were released that night, and charges were dropped against Joe. Michael was given probation and a year of community service. But it wasn't until he wrecked another car a couple of years later that Michael started to realize the God he was running from was trying to get his attention. Both times I wasn't wearing a seatbelt, cars were crushed. And I knew in my, in my heart and in my head that this was God. The fact that I'm not seriously injured, <laughs> you know, the fact that I didn't die, it was God. 
Michael knew it was time to change, but it wasn't that simple. I was getting suicidal thoughts, depression hit me, and I just, I tried everything to make myself happy in my own power and abilities. I tried more drugs, I tried more relationships, I plunged myself into my music. Every time I got what I wanted, I was still empty, broken, unhappy. And um, I came to that place of like, wow, I can't get myself out of this. Either I'm gonna die or I'm gonna reach out to Jesus and see if he is who people say he is. At 20, he decided it was time to stop running. Got in my room and I opened up that Bible that my sister gave me. And it was like the words were just leaping off the pages. And I knew it was God. My heart just broken, just calling out to Jesus. If you are who they say you are, I need you. And in that moment, it was like the whole atmosphere shifted in the room. Just his love poured into my heart. It was very, very tangible. The fear, the depression, the hopelessness just was just evaporated. I thought, this is better than drugs. And I remember hearing the voice of the Lord uh, for the first time very, very clearly. And he said to me, son, I have plans for your life. Michael couldn't wait to tell his parents he had given his life to Christ. He told me that he had this amazing encounter with God and, and uh, just weeping, You're just so happy. It's beautiful, you know, just beautiful. God answered all our prayers. Inside of me was jumping up inside out, you know, and I knew God was going to use him. Michael says with God's strength, he was able to clean up every area of his life. Then in 2012, he graduated from Christ for the Nations Institute and began working overseas as a missionary. There, he met his wife, Selena. Today, they are still active in ministry and are raising a family together. I always thought God is about following rules and religious rituals and things, but no, it really is about a vibrant relationship with a loving Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Don't give up on your loved ones because God sees every tear he sees you, he hears your prayers. With God, all things are possible. It doesn't matter how deep, how dark, uh, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. He's there with open arms. Great words, it doesn't matter how deep and how dark, it doesn't matter what you've done. You know, the Lord says, all manner of sins and blasphemies will be forgiven the sons of man. All things, whatever you've done, God isn't looking to beat you up. God isn't looking to send you to hell. What God wants to do is to have you as a son of his, as part of the family of God, and part of the work in the kingdom of God. He wants your conscience cleansed from dead works that you might serve the living God. That's what he says. God doesn't want to send you to hell. God doesn't want to cast you out with the devil and his angels. God wants to have you as part of his family, and he's reaching out to you right now. And as Michael Lombardo found, and he said, you know, I've, I've tried it all. And like Augustine said, our hearts are restlessly rest in thee. And Michael's heart was restless. He couldn't find peace. He tried all the things. He was a musician. He had drugs. He had women. He had all this stuff. But he still was unhappy. And then he turned to Jesus, and Jesus met him. Now, that's the thing that we offer you today. If your heart is restless, it will not be at rest and at peace until you come to the Lord. And your Father is just waiting to throw his arms around you and say, Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. You're part of my family. I forgive you. I cleanse you. Now, come on and enter into the kingdom of God. If you want that, I want you to pray with me. A very simple prayer. I don't want to make a big deal of it. But you just call upon the name of the Lord. And whoever will call upon the name of the Lord God shall be saved. Pray these words. Jesus, that's right. Pray with me. Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me. And I know that you rose again that I might live. And I know that you are stand willing to forgive me of anything that I've done that's wrong because you are love itself. 
So I come to you now and ask you to cleanse me, to save me, and from this moment on, I am yours and you are mine. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer. Thank you that you've come into my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to give you something that will get you, get you going. It's 1-800-700-7000. Call in and say, look, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. And I want to send you a book, a little book that we've had for some time called A New Day. It will tell you about what it means to be born again, tell you what it means to have your life transformed. It will tell you how to live for the Lord. And there's a little compact disc and a little booklet in here. I'll give it to you free. But that, the book is not important, and there's no money involved. All I ask you to do is call right now and tell somebody, I have just come to Jesus. And the angels of heaven are rejoicing over one sinner that repents. So please pick up the phone and call 1-800-700-7000. Say, yes, I heard what you were saying. Yes, I have received Jesus. And somebody's on the phone will just be delighted to have that, that good news. But there's no money, none at all. So go to the phone, call in. Somebody's here who loves you right now. Terry. Still to come on today's show, Saving Moses. Marilyn Hickey's daughter is rescuing children in some of the worst places on earth. You don't want to miss her incredible stories after this. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. An upcoming Marvel Comics film will feature the first gay kiss in the history of the multi-movie franchise. The film called The Eternals will be released this fall. The kiss was recently filmed with one of the actors in the movie saying, it's a beautiful, very moving kiss. Everyone cried on set. One of the lead actors in the movie is gay with a husband. The Marvel movies has grossed more than $22 billion worldwide since the franchise began in 2008. Well, a revival is taking place in Tennessee as churches from various denominations have partnered together in prayer and fasting. East Rogersville Baptist Church has been the launching pad. This video shows a local family, the Bowmans, singing after one of the revival services. Awaken Tennessee is a 30-day initiative for prayer and fasting that started January 26th and runs through February 23rd. The church pastor told the Rogersville Review newspaper that this past Sunday the Holy Spirit came down and took control. To learn more about the revival and to get the very latest from CBN News, go to our website, cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Newborn girls left for dead in a field. Police called a local orphanage to see if they'd take them in. If they said no, the babies would go back to the field. When Sarah Bowling heard that story and held those newborns, she knew she needed to help. Take a look. Sarah Bowling is an author, speaker, and Bible teacher, much like her well-known mother, Marilyn Hickey. Sarah is also the founder of Saving Moses, a ministry devoted to saving babies and toddlers in places where they're most malnourished and in danger. One outreach of Saving Moses is called Night Care, where sex workers can bring their young children while they work. People were like, so you're in favor of prostitution because you take care of these babies, so these, these ladies can go out and do that. I'm like, I prefer to say that I'm supporting the babies and toddlers and protecting them. In her new book, Hanging by a Thread, Sarah tells how needy little ones captured her heart and how Saving Moses rescues them. Sarah Bowling is here with us now. We welcome you back to the 700 thank Club, thank Sarah. You, thank you. Talk a little bit about those two children in Ethiopia and how this opened your eyes. Yeah, I remember holding them and they said, you know, these were, and they were only days old. Yeah. And their names were Sarah and Ruth. And I have kids, three kids, and my daughter was with me on that trip. She was eight years old at that time. And I was just completely, I was a puddle. I mean, I was crying and sobbing. I'm like, <gasps> and I thought, what orphanage would say no? But then I learned, I was like, oh, because orphanages have limited resources. So they, they try to help the most kids they can, and babies take a lot of resources. That's why. So I was like, oh, well, we could step into that and do something. 
And if you take everybody, you don't help anybody. Right? Exactly. Saving Moses, Moses focuses on children from birth to five. What's so significant about that age bracket? Oh, that's the, the formative years. Our worldview is formed by the time we're five. I mean, all nutritional things, your brain development, your social interactions, attachment, bonding. I mean, the whole, like, who we are as adults really starts as in that groundwork. I mean, that's foundation for everything we do. You have a really touching story in the book about a little girl in Angola that you ran into. Tell us about that. Oh, Two years Angelina, old, right? Angelina, yeah, Angelina. And we were there, and the doctor said, can your team give blood? We, you know, universal blood donor. And my photographer said, I'm a universal blood donor. So he gave blood because her life was hanging by a thread. Mm -hmm. And we donated, all of us, we donated blood because they had nothing in the blood bank. And so we think, oh, God brought us here just on time to save Angelina. And uh, the blood they put in her and everything, but we were too late. And she still died within like 24 hours of us being there. And it just ripped my heart out. I thought, oh. And it's a matter of food. Yeah. And that's the big issue, isn't it? No <laughs> nutrition for yeah. these kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No and that's hard for us to get our head around, particularly in America, because it's just kind of yeah. It's assumed. But the good thing about it is it's solvable. You know, there are some things like disease that would be, you know, disease can often be a part totally. of what you deal with. But talk a little bit about the night care centers, because I think, you know, people, that's a hard nugget for some people sure. to swallow. But you are... Talk about where these kids would be if you didn't have sure. night care centers. So I interviewed the moms in, a, in the largest brothel in Bangladesh, and I said, what do you do with your baby or toddler while you're working? Eight out of ten of those moms said, the baby or my toddler is on the bed with me while I'm working. Yeah. And I remember hearing that. I, and, then, and then they said immediately, they said, it's not uncommon for a client to roll over and molest my toddler oh my. when he's done with me. And so... That reality, I'm like, that's the day-to-day -day reality. So instead of, you know, in America, we have daycare. So the night care is what's essential. It's what's needed because you take the babies and toddlers out. And, and I appreciate, help the women for sure. But the people who are in the immediate, like crosshairs of, of real risk and danger are those babies and toddlers. So let's protect them. Let's give them food, give them shelter, give them a safe place to sleep. And then moms can be with them in the daytime. It really gives you an opportunity to have relationship with the moms. I mean, in the book, it's so clear that the moms are so grateful yes. to have a place to bring their children. But you had, you had to create relationship with these women. I mean, it didn't just happen. Their world is fraught with yeah. not being able to trust anybody. And right. so it's been a process, hasn't it? It has. And when I look after the thing that's most important to them, their baby, yeah. Then it's, an, you know, if, if I do good and I love, genuinely love their baby, mm -hmm. then the moms are like, okay. And it is trust. It's so hard for us in our culture, I think, Sarah, to understand that a woman has to do some of these things in order to live. I mean, these aren't women who have just gone astray morally. Sure. These are women who are trying to feed their babies, see them live another yeah. day. That's exactly It's another right. story, isn't it? It is, because they're not educated. They don't have any other vocation or profession. They don't have, this is a day-to-day -day survival just to put food on the table. Women need to work and not in that profession. Are there opportunities to help women come out of this you bet. lifestyle? You bet, there's lots of NGOs, nonprofit organizations that work in that space, vocational rehab and counseling and lots of organizations that do that, which I'm all, when we partner with them. Absolutely. So when moms talk to us and say, hey, we'd like to get out, great, we have resources to help with that. Tell me about birth aid. Yeah. What is that? So those are babies that, the moms who are pregnant and they're in high risk areas, so Middle East areas, um, places, you know, like we would hear about Syria, Iraq, and some of those places, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, where there's been conflict, conflict areas. And so we come in with neonatal care and postnatal care, obstetrics and delivery, delivery and how to deliver safe, and places that also that are highly unstable, Afghanistan, some of those places, and we get to do what we call birth aid. We just started birth aid, and I'm so thrilled because these babies, they get a chance and a healthy delivery and a healthy start. I mean, those first hours, days of a baby's life, <laughs> I mean, it's hanging by a thread, literally. So often we hear about what's going on in these countries and we don't even think about women who are giving birth in the middle of it all. Right, you know? right. Well, the book is called Hanging by a Thread. You can learn more about Sarah and the Saving Moses story by getting her book. It is fascinating and she's having a huge impact on the lives of women and children and many, many of the world 
worst areas in the world. So hanging by a thread. Sarah, thank you. Thank You're you, a jewel. Thank you, thank Great you. Great to have you here. Thanks. Still ahead, the part of the program that you've been waiting for, your questions and some honest answers. Catherine says, the Bible says that there are no tears or sadness in heaven, but what happens when we realize that certain family members and friends aren't there? Pat's gonna answer that one when we come back. And I know that many of you watch this program on a regular basis, and I just want you to hear about Pat's latest, greatest. And I want you to know it's yours when you join the 700 Club 2. We got a twofer going here. This is actually yes, great. Right. 10 Laws for Success, Keys to Win in Work, Family, and Finance. This is an amazing book, and some of the comments we've had from viewers who've already received it are that, that it's teaching them how to live life successfully every day. This is from the Word of God. We want you to have it, and he's got a new one, folks, a brand new one. You're about to celebrate a big birthday. Yes, that's right. That's this right. coincide with number 90 for me. Well, this is, I have walked with the living God 90 years of Pat sharing how God has impacted his life. And I think you're going to love it. This is the first two chapters. So we just want to whet your appetite, really, because the book's coming out on Amazon in the not too distant future. But these are both yours when you join the 700 Club now. If you're already a 700 Club member, you'll be receiving your copy of this. But there's our toll free number, 1 800 700 7000. So I Give us a call. Publisher, by the way, I thought this was going to be out in June. They say they'll have it out in May, and it will be available wherever books are sold, not just Amazon. Oh, great. So th this is a big book. It's, it's 90 years of walking with God. It's, it's a bold statement of how God can work today in the life of somebody. And when you get through reading it, nobody will ever doubt the existence of the living God when they read that Amen. book. I promise Amen. it to you. Great. We right. look forward to the Questions. whole thing. Let's I just go. want to say real fast, too, a reminder that next Wednesday, we're going to be doing a special voicemail edition of your question and honest answers. So if you have a question for Pat and you want to hear it as asked on the program, here's the special number you call, 1-800-677-7884. When you call, you just leave a voicemail message with your question, and then we'll be listening to that and answering those questions next Wednesday, February 26th, right here on the 700 Club. So let me give you the number one more time. It's 1-800-677-7884. Okay. All right. Today's email. Let's you ready? Go for it. This is Marcy who says, Pat, I love you and watch the show almost daily. Someone wrote in and asked what to do in response to severe disrespect from a daughter-in-law. You advise them to cut ties. Aren't we called to respond to evil with love? I have this going on in my family. Shouldn't I continue to love them, try to forgive them and give it to God knowing he will work it out? Well, absolutely, you should love and keep on loving. Uh, you remember the prophet said, uh, God forbid that I would cease to pray for you. Of course, you, you continue to pray for these people. But the Bible also says, drive out a scoffer and strife will cease. You cannot live in a set attitude of strife all the time. If, if you, 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 you're living on top of a volcano wondering when it's going to explode. So you've got a disrespectful daughter-in-law who you know, wants to explode every time you turn around. You don't need to live in that kind of a, of a, a pressure cooker. Of course, love the person. Of course, continue to pray. But, you know, th there was the Apostle Paul said to one person who was committing sin, he said, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul might and the spirit might be saved the day of Jesus. So, you know, th there comes a time that you just cannot live in strife. You just can't do it. It's not fair to you or to the, the rest of your family. Oh, and sometimes it even does hinder the person from coming to of, reality. Of course so. it does. There's got to be a wake-up call. Okay. Okay, this is Catherine who says, the Bible says that there are no tears or sadness in heaven. But what happens when we realize that certain family members and friends aren't there? Aren't there? Will God remove our memory of their existence? No, he won't remove the memory. But look, when you're in the presence of God. I mean, you're talking about the, the, the God who fills the universe. His glory will be everywhere. And you'll be caught up into the presence of God Almighty. And no, there won't be any more tears of sorrow or crying. Uh, you know, the former things have passed away and all has become new. So you, you, I know you'll have love, but the, the love that you have for that family member will be eclipsed 
by the love that God has given you. I mean, that's what it amounts to. That's why there won't be. All right. This is Michelle, who says, with locusts in Africa, the coronavirus in China, storms <laughs> in the Philippines, the weather in America and Canada, and the current toxic political situation here in the USA, it seems more overwhelming than at any time in history. Is all this that is going on part of what Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21? Also, what does it mean that no man knows the day or the hour of his coming? I thought we were to expect him to come at any time. Well, expecting to come doesn't mean you know it. Jesus said even the Son doesn't know when it's going to be. The angels don't know. He said the Father hadn't even told me when it's going to be. I'm coming back, but y you don't know. And so the, Paul said when, when they say peace, peace and safety, that day will overtake them like uh, travail on a woman with, with child. But it's going to come. But no, you don't know the day or the hour, the day or the hour. But uh, we can live in expectation that he'll come back tonight, but we don't know that. All right, one last question. Uh, what does it mean when the Bible says, what you bind on earth, you bind in heaven? Joseph asks. Right, the, the, the old statement was that the rabbis bound uh, rules and regulations on people. And so the Lord said to the church, when you set up a rule as the body of Christ, that will be bound on earth and it will be bound in heaven. We will back up your decisions when you are moving under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. We'll leave you with today's power message from 1 Corinthians. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Thanks so much for being with us. And for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We've got an exciting show tomorrow. You don't want to miss it. And remember that questions, get your questions in for that show next Friday, next Wednesday. See you.